overwhelming, too busy, too frenzied, too discouraging. We're caught up in the realities of life and in every direction. It's hard to find rest and focus. And in those times, it's hard to find that sense of peace and light and life that God gives. And we think maybe something's gone wrong. Or we think life is too hard. Well, this is where we press on in our discussion of the disciplines of community and see how the discipline of gratitude is not just a feeling that we can experience, it's a choice we have. And in taking hold of this discipline, we become people who reshape even the communities we're in. Because when we're thankful, we resonate a hope and faith in God. When we are discouraged, and give in to that, or when we're overwhelmed and give in to that, or when we're angry and only see the bad things, the injustice, the pain, the frustration of those things around us. We let that chaos inside of us and become overwhelmed and dragged down into the muck and the mire. So what is gratitude? Let's talk about that this time around. We begin as we should begin. In Genesis 1, we begin with the beginning. God is good. We'll say that, right? We can affirm that. Is that. If that's not the starting point of our understanding of gratitude, then we are probably depending on something that is insufficient. If we're hopeful that politics will be put right, <laughs> whew, we're going to be disappointed. If we're hopeful that life is going to get sorted out and we'll have all our ducks in the row and the job and finances and family and relationships and everything is just going to be fine and until then we'll wait there's always something what me and my wife say you want to get get past the one thing there's the next thing coming up but god god is good we know that god is good god is good and his goodness isn't dependent on circumstances his goodness isn't dependent on who is elected or whether i get that job i'm applying for or what kind of car i drive or what school my kids are in or how that person re- responded to me no god is good because god is good and he invites us into his presence god is his own goodness god is love and you know what what god makes is good the good god does good things and he says so himself so who can argue are you gonna argue with god i hope not Genesis 1, and, and god said let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let the dry ground appear and it was so. And God saw that it was good. That's not the whole passage, but you know that you know this chapter. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the guy, sky. So God created. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth. And every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the field, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything he had made. And indeed, it was very good. It's good. It's not a flippant statement. That may be one of the most profound theological statements we can say. It's good because God is good and God made good things. But of course, the Bible doesn't stop here. And if it did stop here, we'd probably all be in a much happier state because God wouldn't have had to do all the other things he did in responding to what comes next. Genesis 2. So God is good, and God isn't just this passive good God who likes to keep all the goodness to himself and let everyone else suffer. No, no, God is a giver. God's a creator. God invites his creation into his bounty. And God gives rest. God gives life. God gives, you name it. What does God give? Think about that for a second. How would you finish that sentence? God gives. Genesis 2. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may eat freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall die. And what do we focus on? All the things we've been given? The one thing we're not given. Well, I know human psychology. I know myself well enough. You get, you get 20 good responses and one really negative response. Which one do you think about the rest of the day? Right. <laughs> it's human nature. So we don't think of the thousands and thousands, for instance, of different things we can eat. Why did God make this one thing they couldn't eat? Well, there's a reason for that, I think. But that's not the, necessarily the basis for, for this discussion. The reality is, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. Be thankful. And then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should do it alone, to be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So God thinks community is good at the very basis before all things start falling apart in the narrative. Before every, we see God saying there's an inner need to have others. I will make this other. And in this community, there will be goodness. Community is good and gratitude comes out of this experience and expression of shared life. It's good. Let's jump to Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Now shall you touch it, or you shall die. Which part does the, spirit, does the serpent go on to emphasize? The many things they have, the bounty they have, or this one way, this one little barrier, this one little no. Well, you know the story. God says, look at all you gain. Look at all you have. Look at is going these good things in your life. Look at all this grace. The serpent, oh, you lack this one thing? <laughs> huh, interesting. Well, God has that. Why does God not want you to have that? Interesting, huh? What's it about that thing that you're not good enough for? You heard this whisper in your head. Look at all the things you have. Oh, that person has a nicer car. Oh, look at those opportunities that person gets. We lose sight of the things we have been given. We become obsessed with the things that we don't. And where does that turn us? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there's nothing bad, inherently bad in it. And there was delight to the eyes. This is pretty. This is nice. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Who doesn't want to be wise? Do you not want to be wise? Rationalizing our greed. Rationalizing our ingratitude. She took of the fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. So this first sin, initial break, came out of a distorted perspective. All was good. Everything was given to them. But they could, all they could see was what they didn't have. Thus sin was, and sin is. I would argue that sin fundamentally carries on this perspective. We're caught up in ingratitude. We're caught up in the things we don't have. We become obsessed with our lack rather than feeling peace with what we do have. We compare and contrast, letting our own value being shaped by what is happening around us, not in some absolute sense of what is going to satisfy our actual needs, even what's going to satisfy our desires, but we're told, this is the thing you want. Why don't you have it? This is the thing they have. Why do they get it? Thus sin was, and sin is. Gratitude has become a bigger issue than you thought, isn't it? In gratitude, you have gluttony, envy, lust. Go down the list. What if you, Adam and Eve were truly thankful? And Adam and Eve said to the serpent, Who wants that fruit? There's these, all these other fruits we can have. Just that. What if we said that in our own lives? That's the issue, isn't it? Well, however you want to talk about original sin, there's this part of us that's broken, that's for certain. But there's also this part of us that, that takes it up for our own and lives it out on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't have this, I don't have that. But God, but God we know is good. The course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. What is good? And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. It's good. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Eh, 
that's not so good. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. God is not good to me, he felt inside. Why does Abel get the privilege? Why does Abel get the honor? Why not me? And we who read this often, if you'll hear sermons on this, try to come up with some reason or explanation. Try to make sense of this that matches our pattern of justice. We're not told. Everything is reading into it. We're not told. All we're told is Abel was accepted and Cain, Cain's sacrifice wasn't. We want there to be a reason, but the reason isn't there. And that's not the issue at hand. That's the key issue. When we try to come up with reasons why Cain was rejected, we then create our own justifications. But if we see that the reasons for acceptance and non-acceptance aren't even given, we come closer to the intent and orientation of this passage that connects sharp more strongly with Genesis 3. Cain was very angry. His countenance fell. He saw some. He saw that which he wanted but didn't have. So what did he do? The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, we not be accepted. And if you do not do well, sin is looking at the door. Its desire is for you, and you must master it. And remember, this is after we've been kicked out of the garden. God is telling Cain, don't give in to your anger. Don't give in to your ingratitude. Sin is going to take advantage of that and lead you down a very bad path. Its desire is to eat you up. You must master it. God says, be good, Cain. Be good. The opportunity is there. What could Cain have done instead of what you know happened? What could Cain have done in response to this? I pause the story here so that you can say, what would you do? There's someone you know and you both turn in an assignment, let's bring this home, or a sermon, or, or some other project at work. You both turn in, you spent as much time on it as this other person. You know it's just as good. Well, you think it's just as good, right? We don't always know what's going on. We think it's just as good. They get an A, you get a B. They get a promotion, you get passed over. It's unjust. You can come up with a lot of reasons of injustice. And many of them are very valid. And I'm not dismissing those experiences of injustice. But again, in light of this topic, that's not the issue. What's the issue? How do we respond in situations where anger or frustration or the shadows of life overwhelm us when sin is looking at its door? How do we respond? Its desire is for you. Not in terms of making you a better person or fixing the situation to undermine you to destroy you, to tear apart the community you're in. What could Cain have done? Well, we know what Cain did. Out of his anger, out of his frustration, he killed Abel. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. In trying to appease that inner turmoil, he responded in anger and murder. And it didn't solve the problem, it exacerbated the problem, it made even his own life worse. Where was he to go now? The th even the things he had were taken away. And others would respond to him the same way he responded. And the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the, the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch and he built a city and named it Enoch after his son, Enoch. God is good. God doesn't give up. God is faithful. But that doesn't mean our experiences and our responses don't cause problems that resonate deeper and thoroughly. God is good. God is still good. Whew. People, Genesis 5, this is the list of the descendants of Adam. When God created humankind, he made them in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them humankind when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his likeness. We'll pre press on through the genealogy. After Noah, when we get to Noah was 500 years old. Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I thought I was old when I had kids in my late 30s. God continues to be good. The people multiplied. People found community. People found relationships. Humanity continued. God continues to be good. People? People not so much. Why? Why not? 
What's this story here? Well, we can go back to Cain. And for that, we can go back to Adam and Eve. Sin. People sin. Not only do people sin, people respond. People have been mastered by sin. That warning that God gave Cain has become the prediction, the experience of all of us. Sin is the answer of why we are not good and can't be good and tend to respond not good. But what drives sin? What drives us in our sin? What is that root of sin that continues to desire us even more than we desire it? To master us, to dissipate us, to fracture community. What drives it? God is still good even in Genesis 6 through 9. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. People aren't good. They're inclined to evil and destruction and chaos. And the Lord was sorry. He made them and grieved him to the heart. And so he said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I've created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I'm so sorry I made them. Noah. Ah, Noah. Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. God said, there is a man who is good. Why? We're not told all the reasons. But we can assume it's because God, Noah was obedient. Noah lived in light of God's goodness. God blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Human beings and animals and creeping things and birds of the air. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left. And those that were with him in the ark and the water swelled on the earth for 150 days. And the bow is in the clouds, continues. This is the summary version. The bow is in the clouds, God says. I, I will see it. I remember the everlasting covenant between God and every little creature of all flesh that is on the earth. This is a sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. God is committed to the goodness. Life, humanity, everything got so chaotic. Sin was became so thoroughly embedded in the human experience. God started over. And we have Noah. But as you know, things did not just get back on track. Shall we go on? <laughs> we could read the whole Bible in light of this. God is good and God does good things and God invites people into this goodness to be thankful and gracious and love one another. And how do people respond? Taking and stealing and destroying, caught up in their own passions, caught up in their own envy, experiencing injustice and responding with injustice. Kind to kind, not kindness to kindness. The narrative of scripture confronts us at every point and argues that God himself enters in. God so loves the world. So now we, we who are participants with God, learn to recognize a pattern and participate in this power of life and love. And all through and to the end of the Bible, recognition of God's goodness is key. Those who recognize God's goodness, those who were able to enter into it and allow this to shape their perspective on everything that was happening, they pressed on. So the starting point for thanksgiving, and gratitude, God is good. Fundamental statement. We, we can't get around this. We have to begin with the idea that God is good. Otherwise, turmoil is going to start at the very beginning. But if we say God is good, then we are oriented no matter what the situation. Because then we know that God does that which is good. God is good. God does that which is good. So what then do we learn to expect? We have hope. A hope driven by faith and oriented love and expressed in gratitude. Because in gratitude, we learn to see as good what God sees as good. In gratitude, we begin to look through the eyes of faith and hope rather than through the eyes of frustration and lack. We learn to ex look through the eyes of God's purposes and plans rather than through the experiences of history and our own stories. We can easily obsess about those things that have gone wrong or the wrongs done to us. In gratitude to God, we enter into a community defined by thanksgiving, not a community defined by demands and competition and chaos. The community of those saved by Christ are those who are a community of the thankful, a community of those full of grace and gratitude for what God has done and in this gratitude can participate together in celebration of the goodness of God's work in participating of this, in this, in acknowledging it, we go forth with praise and expectation and hope. That's the goal, the starting point. But what do we focus on in our stories? 
Think of your day. What do you focus on? Do you focus on what has gone well and right? Or do you focus on the lack and the gaps? Bring it even closer. An orientation and discipline. Where can we see the goodness of God in our stories? Think about your day. Where can you see the goodness of God in this day, in this past week? A discipline of memory is a discipline indeed because our memory, we think we're passive receivers of it, but we're not. We can enter into our memory and enter into our expectations in light of the call of God for us. And that is our expression of worship. When we enter into the stories, enter into our life, enter into our community, acknowledging that God is good and that we are called to love God and love neighbor. So let's go back to our key orienting theme. The key orienting theme, this central element of all the law, the law of Israel and the law of Christ, love God and love your neighbor. Struggling, loving God um, at times in, 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 and resonating with what when Wesley said that in, in times in my life where I'm like, I don't know. But I pressed on. And in that, I was in the pursuit of honesty and truth-telling. I'm acknowledging the fact that, that doubt is there. I don't want to celebrate doubt, but that's often part of our story. And, and being honest and telling the truth about it means uh, uh, confronting it for what it is and finding ways and finding paths to find faith anew. Because when I talked about struggling with God, I don't see that as a place of maturity or a place to settle in. And you get some of that. Some people are so celebratory of doubt that that's all they have to offer. Well, why should I believe them about anything? That's not what we're called to live into, even if that's an honest admission of where we're at in the journey. Loving God and loving neighbor, however, is, is the destination and the journey. It's both an experience. We can, we can feel love for God. We can feel love for our neighbor. But oftentimes we don't. So we're called to enact it, not out of a dishonesty, but out of a discipline. Because those are the kinds of people we seek to become, and so we practice it. We discipline ourselves. We orient ourselves. We fight against that which tears us down. We remind ourselves of God's promises, which is tricky because how do we learn to love? Can you, can you convince yourself to love somebody? That's, you know, maybe not always in romantic terms, but you, there's ways in which we can grow in coming to terms with a person. I mean, what gets us to simply like a person? What causes us to stop liking a person? It's the stories we tell, the thoughts we dwell on. What causes us to feel closer to God? What causes us to feel more distant from God? I would argue and suggest that gratitude underlines all of these things. If we are thankful for someone, if we, re if we look into their stories and see the good, helpful, the promising, it's not that we're going to be dismissive or overlook any faults. So this, we don't want to we'll go back into dishonesty. I think this is why this is a progression of the discussion. But if the only thing you think about a person is all the things they've done wrong or place, all the things they've done wrong, you can grow into a place of frustration and alienation and discouragement. If the only thing you can think about is all the things you don't have or the way God hasn't followed through with what you'd want, the farther and farther we come away from God. So thanksgiving, gratitude, this orientating ideal that allows us then to enter into a place of love that forms us as a community. If we have no gratitude, if we're, all we're doing is critiques and complaints, then our very being becomes distorted. But if we, in gratitude, come to terms with what is going on, an honesty about the situation, but if we form that in gratitude, then we become peacemakers. Because we have an inner peace in ourselves that's oriented by God's goodness, not by the situation's goodness or the other person's goodness. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move, remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful, or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Huh. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly. 
But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully. Now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. And the greatest of these is love. So Thanksgiving really is an expression of faith. Who or what do we believe in? Do we believe in a God who we can be thankful to? Do we believe in a God who is withholding? What kind of God do we believe in? Really, uh, Thanksgiving is a fundamental expression of faith. Again, not, not in an artificial way. In a genuine, honest, truth-telling way. See, we're not after having a theme on the truth-telling and promise-keeping. We're not we're not wanting to just jump into a community that's that's based on artificiality. But what we do want is to make sure that we're basing our discussions and we're orienting our community rightly in light of the, the attitudes God wants us to hold, the kind of people we are to be. And we are shaped and we be, are a certain kind of people based on who or what we believe in. Do we believe God is good? Is God good? Answer that. Do you believe that God is loving? Do you? Do we believe that God is able? So we can have God, a good God and a loving God, but a God who's not powerful enough and God might want to do something. Or might want to shape things, but it was sort of out of his control. So, do you believe God is able, though? Good, loving, able. Do you believe that God is? You know, what are all the things that you sh- that you know you should be believing about God? Well, if you were to believe those things, how would that orient your perspective on life, and the challenges, and the opportunities around you? What are we supposed to believe about God? What does the Bible tell us about God? What is revelation? What is theology? History? What are the, what are these things that say these are the things you should believe about God? We know those might be true, but then, on the other hand, what do our actions and attitudes actually say? How do your actions say you believe? Do your actions and attitudes express faith in God or doubt or faith in something else? Or that God is just a certain part of a life, but there's all these other concerns we need to orient us? How do your actions speak? Again, this is where Thanksgiving becomes a key element of real faith. If we truly believe in God, we are thankful. Help us, Lord, in our unbelief, right? Gratitude strikes against consumerism. When we are thankful, when we have gratitude, we hold on to what we know we should believe. And in that, we're not caught up in all those things that we feel we need or that others have. Instead of more, 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 we learn to be content in all circumstances. Paul was a great holder in thanksgiving. And we think, oh, we need we need to learn how to be content. No. <laughs> if we start by saying, I should be content, that's starting us off in our own strength. We have to be oriented in God and a right perspective on God. And it's very difficult to say, I don't believe, I don't have enough faith here. But that's, again, the honest place. And in community, we have to begin in the honest place. We can say, this is who I want to be. I want to be more thankful. But right now, I'm really struggling with this. Well, that's where discipline steps in. Because just like if we haven't gone running in a while, or any other kind of exercise or practice. If you haven't done it in a while, it's hard to do it first. But you don't will your way into doing it better. I can't, I went out running today for the first time in a while. Well, I don't run quite as far as I used to run when I was running regularly. But at the same time, I can't will myself just to run farther. I have to just go out and run. I have to be disciplined about this. So too with gratitude. Gratitude is a discipline. We have to learn how to reshape our perspective on this world we have to see the good in the moment and part of that is being intentional about seeing the good in the moment rather than the frustrations frustrations will always be there there's always something and we can go so get so caught up in that we lose the ability to identify the good and in in losing the ability to see the good are we even able to see god because god's good and god does good things again it's not dismissing or ignoring the frustrations it's choosing to, to hold on to that which feeds into our sense of self. What gives me meaning? Does do, Am I defined by the things that God has done in me and through me? The, the story that he's written? Or am I defined by the things I lack? The opportunities I haven't had? The embarrassing times? What feeds into our sense of self versus what feeds into our actions? What feeds into our sense of well-being and our sense of contentment? If we're driven only by the frustrations, then we're going to be driven away from seeing God that can address that's the thing only God gives the true answer for those frustrations so gratitude counterintuitively like so much of theology is 
counterintuitive holding on to gratitude orients is in the right direction that actually addresses the frustrations. But if we only focus on the frustrations and the injustices, then those are going to swallow us up. They want to master us. So gratitude can spur transformation. Ingratitude can embed apathy. What difference would this make in our communities if we began with gratitude and oriented in gratitude, even as we are honest about the realities of life around us? in our communities, in our context, in our nation, in our world? How would, how could we talk to people we disagree with if we began with a sense of the good rather than a sense of the lacking? Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his. For he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if you would only hear his voice, not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massah in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declare it on my oath in my anger they shall never never enter my rest it's dangerous to give in to ingratitude and to be shaped by that but if we are oriented in gratitude we find the rest that god offers even in the wilderness and beyond so thanksgiving is hope thanksgiving orients not only how we view the past and the present but thanksgiving orients how we age the future where do we put our hope i can be thankful for context when i'm not caught up in despair about what might come next it's hard when I look ahead and say, I don't know what I'm going to be doing for, for a job in a year. And you have to anticipate these things in, in the academic world. Or am I going to be working? Well, God has been very good in opening up doors. I, God, there are many good things, but if I only get caught up in the, the despair or the frustration or the discouragement about not seeing an answer yet about the future, then my present is clouded. So, but I can only be thankful for the context when I'm not caught up in despair about what might come next. If we live in the blessings of the moment, we see God in the moment, which is where God is. God often doesn't say, here's the eight things I'm going to do in the future, but God says, trust me in the present. So can we live in the blessings of the moment and trust that God is going to do good things? For instance, I can be thankful for people in my life when I do not put the burden on them to answer my need for meaning or purpose or identity. Or to provide me with what I think I need. I remember when I was uh, younger, um, in my 20s, and I had these close friends, but I wasn't dating anyone. And they were all caught up in in their own relationships. And I, there were times in which I got mad at them and frustrated and, and thought, I don't know why, uh, that they're not living up to sort of my expectations. And I realized I was putting a burden on them that they couldn't live up to. They weren't supposed to give me meaning. They weren't supposed to give me the answer to my social needs. I mean, yes, they could be helpful or not helpful, but ultimately if my identity wasn't established in God, no one can fulfill that. Same thing with, with even now that I'm married, my wife. If I'm looking for my wife to give me a validation and to give me meaning and purpose, we're gonna get in trouble because I can't do that for her and she can't do that for me. And I can be thankful for her, especially when I see her in light of the blessings that God has done in our life and arranging our story together. But I was unmarried for a long time. I got married in my mid-30s. Early. I know many others aren't married, and that's, just, that's not the ultimate answer. And yet we, we shape ourselves as if that other person, if we just have the right romance or just have the right experience or just have the right church, then we'll be, find satisfaction. Provide me with what I think I need from work. Or student responses, you know, the egos that feeds into this. What If we're always bouncing around, we well, you know what? We're all going to fail each other. None of us can live up to the demands of giving each other validation and identity. We can encourage, we can exhort, we can share, we can hope with each other, we can be a community. But it's only in establishing our thanksgiving in God that we have hope in the moment. And hope when we come to those times when other people fail us. And we can sustain a relationship with them in light of the fact that it's God who gives us hope, not them. Do they give me ultimate validation? That's a good way of addressing our situation. Sometimes we just expect too much from people and they can never live up to it. So, of course, they're going to disappoint. 
Sometimes people are disappointed, so don't get me wrong. Some people uh, fail their callings in, in certain ways. So it's not this, this, this is, again, we're not getting into a dishonesty situation here. But there's a fine line between them failing their callings and them not living up to the idea that they need to provide me or the community or whoever else some validation. A lot of churches run like this, right? Pastors are often given the weight of giving meaning and identity to certain churches. So often you'll hear it's this pastor's church or that pastor church, and people in the congregation will put all the weight of, of faith in this person. Oh, you know what? Pastors can't live up to that. Some do. Some try. I mean, some try. They don't do it. They try, and they shape the community based on their identity, but it becomes anemic. Or when they stumble, the community breaks down. We can't expect to give other people validation, ultimate validation, and we can't expect other people to give us ultimate validation. We lose our hope. We lose our thanksgiving. So where do we find ultimate validation? That's the expression of our hope. Hope frees us from the demands of the moment that everyone has to be doing things perfectly or everything has to be going according to absolute standard rules. And it leaves us open to the good work of God, even in the worst circumstances. And this is where the, the honesty of the Bible comes into that. Even in the worst circumstances, people can and should have hope, not because the people around them are doing good, but because God is good. We can thank Jesus for the cross because we know about the resurrection. The work was done on the cross, but we know the resurrection, so there's life, there's hope. We can believe him. We hope, we thank God in hope, even if we can't see the resolution. This is an expression of faith, and faith is expressed in gratitude. Can we be thankful for the things that God has done and is doing, even as we anticipate what's coming next? On the Saturday after Good Friday, people had trouble thanking God, right? But they shouldn't have. They should thank God because Jesus said, this is what I'm doing. In hope, we become thankful for what a situation can be, for what a context can be, for what a people can be. And in Thanksgiving, we live into that reality even now. We become people who resonate that vision. We don't give a vision. We live into a vision. And if we're struggling with why people don't come to terms with our vision, well, how are we living into it? How are we expressing it? Is it our vision or is it God's vision that we're participating in with others? and awakening them to this vision with hope and thanksgiving and gratitude for who they are and what they're doing and sharing. Psalm 107. It's too long to copy here. This is taught me before, right? But this was a pretty long one, but it's well worth reading. So I want you to sit back, close your eyes and listen. Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hands of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for humanity. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness, in utter darkness. Prisoners suffering in iron chains because they rebelled against God's command and despised the plans the Most High. He subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. And they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of the darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for humanity. For he breaks down the gates of bronze and cuts through barns of, bars of iron. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed food and drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for humanity. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his work with songs of joy. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest. They lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love 
and his wonderful deeds for humanity. Let them exalt in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. He turned rivers into deserts, flowing springs into thirsty ground, and fruitful land into salt waste because of the wickedness of those who lived there. He turned the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live, and they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields and planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them. And their numbers greatly increased, and he did not let their hurts diminish. And their numbers decreased, and they were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow. He who pours contempt on nobles makes, made them wander in a trackless waste. But he lifted the needy out of their affliction, and increased their families like flocks. The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked shut their mouths. But the one who is wise heed these things, and ponder the loving deeds of the Lord. Psalm doesn't assume that everything is going good and then we can give thanks. It doesn't assume that even the people did good things and then they could give thanks. What it does, it assumes that the work of life is a work of God. And those who cry out to God can be thankful and celebrate, for God brings victory. Thanksgiving is love. Have you thought of it this way? Thanksgiving creates a context of love. When we're in the context of others, seeing faith and hope in a situation that they may feel desolate, we're giving them hope. If you're comforting someone in darkness and you say, man, you're really stuck, or there's no hope for you, what do they feel? Despair. But if you come to them and pray with them, don't give easy answers, but you pray with them. You say, God is good. I'm going to offer your help, offer hope in the crisis. You give them literally a sense of life. Thanksgiving invites other people in. We look for the best in people. Rather than becoming cynical and discouraging and discouraging, and, and broken and put up barriers. We look for the best in people and situations and continue to make space. Finding our, our meaning in God allows us to make space for people who can and will hurt us. But if we are oriented in thanksgiving in God, we trust that God is bigger than even those situations. Thanksgiving allows us to persist in difficult relationships. Some people are hard to love. And everybody, even if they're really good people, have times in their life when they're hard to love. We all have our brokenness. We all have our things and stuff, right? And if we get so caught up in seeing only the bad or the discouraging or the brokenness in people, we're going to drift away. That's what human nature is. But instead, if we look for the good, if we look for the thanksgiving, if we look for oriented in God's goodness, gratitude in God, and gratitude for what this person can do or has done, we persevere in a new way. If we only emphasize mistakes or errors, we lose interest, connection. We protect ourselves. That's what the human does. But we don't need to protect ourselves if we're in a context where God is good. Now, we remember, this is what the early church did. They were martyred. right? They were killed for their faith. How is that possible? How can they do that? Because they were so thankful for who God is and what God had done. What is death? What is torture? They can persist with God. I love the story of... Uh, Polycarp, it's just, it's, it, if you've never read the martyrdom of Polycarp, right, I encourage you to read it. He was a church, early church leader, and he, like all early church leaders, was, was threatened with arrest, and he felt at first that he was to um, stay as a leader and preserve his role in the community, and then he felt this burden to uh, give himself up and to be a testimony for the people in the face of persecution and evil and injustice. And so he's arrested, and the, when he's about to be burned alive and threatened with wild animals, the proconsul in charge of his supposed trial says, Swear and I will set you at liberty. Reproach Christ. All these Romans wanted to deny Christ. So, but what I love about Polycarp is his thanksgiving, his gratitude is so rich that he can't even think about that. When you're so thankful for something, the idea of reproaching or denying them becomes impossible. Polycarp declared in response, 80 and six years I have served him, and he never did me any injury. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? He's walked with Christ for 86 years in thanksgiving. It's unheard of, unspeakable. What is fire and pain compared to goodness that God has given in response to what God is doing? And in testifying, and the story goes on and on, um, it, it is this foundation of gratitude in God's work became a bulwark for Polycarp to be a testimony. And this testimony for early Christians became a testimony to the wider populace. They're like, why would these people die? What are they testifying? What do they believe in? What are they thankful for? Their thanksgiving in the face of persecution became a testimony to people who were desperate for hope in their own lives. Thanksgiving can provide a boost for a person's self-understanding, 
Sometimes we, we have a skewed perspective of ourselves. We're hyper aware of our faults and minimize our strengths. For whatever reason, we tend to remember every embarrassing thing that ever happened to us. Remember that time when you were 15? You know what I'm talking about. I'd, I remember the time when I was 15 or 25. You could all go back. We all have these moments. We, what else happened that day? Well, we, we, we get this tension in our hearts. And we can get so stuck in those narratives, in those hyper judgment, the, the idea of perfection that we never live up to it, that we become driven by that rather than being driven by peace and love and joy. And others, the thanksgiving that arises in community can share their thanksgiving for us. It's not wrong to say thank you to someone for a, a, something they've done, because oftentimes that they may not be hearing that in themselves, so they need to hear it from others. We provide a mutual support network. And I'm convinced that sometimes God hides some of our self-awareness and our strength so that we don't get a big ego and that we are aware of our faults so that we stay humble, which is a good place to be. But if that's the only thing we have, if that's the only voice we have um, of correction, then we're caught off track. And so sometimes other people are, are specifically meant to speak into our lives. Just we're, we, we often see more in people around us than we see in ourselves. And we're, we wonder why they can't, they can't see this good thing in them. We're, we're called to be a community and speak thanksgiving as a community. Th thanksgiving for each other. Thanksgiving with each other. We are made for community. And part of this is being made to invest in others. Being thankful encourages and highlights their strengths, giving them balance in the work of God and, and the work on their lives and who God has made them to be. They stay humble, but they don't fall into despair. We're not caught in our ego, but we become aware of our strengths and gifts. See that there's, how do you, how do you orient that balance? Well, I believe the spirit has shaped our communities in precisely the right way. Thanksgiving then can be a way of discerning the spirit. Psalm 136, this is the responsive Psalm, which I really like. If you get into the rhythm of this, this is a great psalm for community context to orient rightly. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Now I'm going to read the first, the, the initial verse. I want you, wherever you're at listening to this, to do the responsive. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts. To him alone who does great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights. The sun to govern the day. The moon and stars to govern the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. And brought Israel out from among them. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. And brought Israel through the midst of it. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led the people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings. And killed mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to his servant for Israel. He remembered us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. And what I like about this is if you read just the white parts, there's a lot of harshness and difficulty and stress and strain. The refrain, his love endures forever, becomes an orienting refrain, a reminder It's the harmony that underlies our understanding of the story. If you read the story just on its own, it's very easy to get go up and down in the waves of despair or chaos. But you say his love endures forever. It orients us. And that is how we are to live our lives in a community, 
in light of Christ in every point to orient in light of the fact that it, his love endures forever becomes the refrain in our lives at every step his love endures forever it's a good exercise once an hour or once every five minutes or you know make up your own timing to just use this as a repetitive phrase not as a way of making a charm but as a way of cementing into our heads god's constant participation in this story and his orientation in love so thanksgiving is also a discipline Joy versus happiness. We can say joy is that inner sense of goodness while happiness is that fleeting momentary response to a situation. Gratitude, which is which is a thanksgiving, a hope, a faithful versus expectation, which can be full of tension and anxiety. Something needs to happen, but I don't know what. What is gratitude is? God is good. God does good things. Patience. We can wait. We can endure versus resignation what's the point right do you see how these are become intentional ways of steering our thoughts in the moments of crises or a lack of answer thanksgiving in the pursuit of justice because we are thankful for what god has given us or called us to be we can press us into service for change in our context or in people's lives it's because we are thankful that we say there's more to this context than what people are willing to live in people are, have resigned to to the context or resign to the state of things or they have this expectation that somehow things are just going to naturally get better no but we say we are thankful for what god has done and we are going to live in the attitude of thanksgiving and in hope and in love speak into the situation because we can be better than this we are better this is one of the best most transformative moments weren't a call for how evil the people are but how these people weren't living up to who they were called to be you know better that's paul right all through the epistles you know better gandhi to the english you know better you know better the abolitionists were called to be christians and love each other not not treat people as objects or in humor we're called to love we are thankful that god has made us into a humanity with diversity how do we express that thanksgiving by creating context where this is celebrated but it's so easy to get caught in the divisions to get caught in only the signs of injustice and to fight against each other and ruin each other. Gratitude is a way of transformation. We seek to extend blessings outward and onwards, not to hoard or hide or to get our own because they got theirs. So often the liberation of the oppressor results not in a change in the system, but just an inversion of who the oppressor is. The oppressed become oppressor and continue the cycle. And Back and forth it goes. People fighting against each other and ruining each other and whole countries destroyed. How can we be a people who liberate together in a shared perspective of God's kingdom and love? Not because of what has happened, but because who God is and what God is doing. We are thankful to God, not what these people have done. So we are free to extend his goodness to those even within reach who have done things. God forgive them for they don't know what they do we do we know who god is and we can reach out with the hand of christ from the cross and say join us in paradise thanksgiving is most important i'd argue though least obvious in difficulty thanksgiving can and should happen even in the midst of seriously bad circumstances have you ever been in a really hard time where life around you was full of brokenness what do you do you can't thank god for the situation it doesn't mean you can't find gratitude thank god for those around me oftentimes it is in those moments of great difficulty that we become bonded as a community have you ever been in a time of extreme stress like a natural disaster or some major event where oftentimes we find a unity with those around us a friendship with those around us that's deeper than than before why because we really need each other and we lean in on each other we can thank God for those moments, even as we can acknowledge the difficulty and pray together for the change in the circumstances. We can thank you, God, for wisdom or grace or comfort, ways of navigating, ways of seeing beyond the moment, ways of seeing a way forward, a way of understanding who God has called me to be in this moment. Thank you, God, for the answers you are going to provide. Thanksgiving can even happen in the midst of depression. Now, I speak of this not in a separate sense but because throughout my life i've also battled depression sometimes exceedingly severe depression 
And so when I talk on this, I'm not being like disbelieve, but I genuinely have experienced in my life those times in which Thanksgiving in the midst of depression became the light that allowed me to find life again. Sometimes it was just this tiny little flicker of glimmer and it, at the end of a deep, deep cave, but that was enough to say, I'm going to keep walking. One of the deadly sins, they have these lists of deadly sins, sort of these core categories that other sins sort of orient around. Uh, we talk about the seven deadly sins, but the, the original list was eight, and it was, what's called Akedia, Akedia is one of them. And it was a spiritual depression. It's really, it, it's not just uh, uh, the, depre this, the typical depression, clinical depression. It really has a spiritual element, though I believe there's an overlap to it. The idea that we get caught up in in just despair over the possible around us. Now, this had two elements. It had either some people just like gave up on doing anything, and other people got into a frenzy. They they were so depressed about, they were so discouraged. It actually resulted in a more extroverted. They wanted to constantly visit people or go around. They could never be. They could never stop. Sometimes when I believe when you're depressed, it gets results the same way: anxiety or frenzy. We want to avoid the situation. And sometimes that can give the appearance of activity and positivity, but that's not it at all. When you avoid the circumstances you know, and when you don't want to listen to yourself, it becomes problematic. That's why we have uh, disciplines of solitude. It's a way of coming to terms with yourself, which is often a very scary reality. And the CD is a part of that. It's a deadly sin because it causes us to lose sight of God. So at what point is depression a sin? If we have, so again, this is a dangerous discussion in some ways, precisely because of how awfully many in the church have and continue to have a perspective on this, which is just to say to depressed people, quit being depressed, have faith. Well, that's naive. That's absurd because so often there's, there's more than just a faith issue. There's uh, neurochemical or other things going on that you can't just choose to have, like uh, choose to be happy. Well, sometimes that's an impossibility. Um, and so I'm not saying that. What, what point is it a sin? Well, it's an embracing of the identity. This is the only thing possible. And in my own life, even in the, the darkness of depression, where I was realizing I could embrace it and say no more, or I could say I've experienced this, but I'm going to do those things that lead me down a better path. When I chose to write rather than do some other things, it was when I was writing, I would feel this lightness of being. So I went that direction. Uh, getting more sunshine, drinking more water praying, cutting out kinds of sins in my life. All those things became ways of reorienting myself. Whereas also, I mean, and also just going, just doing the basic things of uh, self-care. I, I, I didn't have uh, counseling or therapy or, or uh, medication, but I probably could have. Um, I didn't have insurance, so I had to do what I had to do. So it was a longer road, but I encouraged that. And part of the pursuit of medication or counseling or all the rest is itself a kind of gratitude because you're saying, even if I don't feel it, I'm going to be disciplined about finding healing. I'm thankful for the body God has given me. So if I get a major wound or break an arm, I'm not going to say, well, that's my body. I just need to believe my arm can work better. No, I go to a hospital and have, have, have get it addressed because I believe my body doesn't need to be like that. And I'm thankful for what God has done and I'm thankful for what is possible. Thanksgiving, of course, in difficulty is especially susceptible to being fake. Thanksgiving should never be fake. It should never be naive, but it can often be an intentional discipline. Sometimes we don't feel thankful. We don't have any sense of there's good around us. So we have to be very intentional about looking for the bright light. We have to go down that category. Who is God? What has God done? Tell intentionally write down the story in light of this is a good person around me. This is a good thing around me. Looking for the bright light, being intentional about calling that out and writing that down and, and, and letting that story start begin to take hold in our minds. And eventually, we start rewriting how we're understanding the story. So gratitude can be something we feel, but it should also be a discipline to pursue. The pursuit of thanksgiving and gratitude is a way of embracing faith. It's an intentional faith. It's not just, I have faith and thus I'm going to live it out. It's saying, I'm going to choose faith. And here are the ways that faith is expressed and I'm going to choose to do those things. But it's not ignoring reality or injustice. If we embrace faith, we orient ourselves rightly in relationship to God, who can then change the circumstances. It's saying, it's only in faith that I have help. And so I'm going to do those things that walk down this road. Remember the people of Israel in the wilderness. They have the promised land. 
but sometimes they had these really difficult moments. It wasn't these subtle, you know, they just didn't feel the presence of God sometimes. It's they didn't have anything to drink. They were starving. There were people attacking them. Well, what do they do? Well, they grumble. Well, again, that's the, the point is God says, I have already promised you this goodness. So walk in the difficulties with thanksgiving because God is good. And in this hope, we shape those around us. The spies who went into the promised land said, we can't do this. It's impossible. Well, they spread despair. Meanwhile, Caleb and Joshua spread the possibilities. Gratitude is a, is a resonating sense of possibility and hope that it can infect those around us. We, we resonate hope or we resonate despair. We resonate gratitude or we, we resonate frustration. What are we resonating in the lives around us, in the community around us? We can't expect those people to fix us. We can be people of light and hope ourselves. Thanksgiving, then, is an embrace of transformation. Just because I believe in God, I will pursue emphasizing the good. Because I believe in God, I will pursue that which helps me to see the good. Again, this is where counseling or medication can be a very pragmatic expression of gratitude. Thank you, God, for this life. Even though I'm feeling darkness everywhere, I am not going to give up or give in, but will pursue hope. In faith, we seek ways to move onward and forward. And it can be true for our inner life, a depression, or it can be true about a context. There's a lot of brokenness in the world. Do we go online and only complain about all those people over there doing the, who did those things? Or do we say, God is good. How can we be people of thanksgiving who move forward? Is God good? Does God do good things? Is God working in this world? Does God love this world? Does God love others? Now, who are we to be in our context in light of those truths? Thank you, God. Some dangers of Thanksgiving. There's, of course, there's dangers of all disciplines. There are some dangers of Thanksgiving. We already talked about some of them. It's come up. Sometimes Thanksgiving can be idealistic or naive. We're thankful for what God is doing or, or, or in some fake way. We, 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 we try to pose as if we're, we're thankful and it's just a show, but in our heart we're full of despair or frustration. Or putting our thanksgiving and gratitude in things that can't live up to it, like elections or wealth or, you know, healthy health. Go down the list. Sometimes if we're putting all our thanksgiving in just the circumstances of the moment or the way things temporarily change, then it can get dashed just as easily as it can be held on to. So we don't want to be idealistic or naive. We don't want to be artificial and fake which is another kind of intentional kind of Thanksgiving. We want to pose as being better off than reality or having more faith. It's kind of going back to the idea of Ananias and Sapphira in, in Acts 5. We want to pose as being better Christians than we are. Well, sometimes we need to be honest. But we, can't, we, don't want to, we don't want to be stuck and say our identity is in doubt or our identity is in despair. But we also have to say, I'm really having trouble seeing God. I need help here. We ask for help. We don't pose. So there's the intentional fakeness there's also the unintentional when we're just not in tune with ourself or context when we're when we just don't know ourselves and and we're thankful for things that just don't matter or we have gratitude for for, for these minor little fripperies or this this the, the little things that just don't count as much we get up we get obsessed with the big building we have or you know what that's those are fine and God, we can celebrate even the small things, but if that's the basis of where we're finding meaning, it can become disorienting when that changes. And we lose the job that we found our meaning in. Thanksgiving without discernment or wisdom can be problematic. We can seek and be thankful for that which is not what God wants for us. So Thanksgiving should never undermine other disciplines like honesty. We have to be, create context where people can be honest about their feelings and experiences. Neither getting stuck in the darkness nor wanting to pose as having perfection, but to have an honest, truth-telling place where we can express thanksgiving in the context of real self-awareness and honesty about our reality. That's the only way you move forward. You don't pose to a doctor or go to a gym and try to lift 800 pounds when you've never worked out. And yet we go to church and try to be those kind of people, oftentimes. And thanksgiving can also be dismissive. Sometimes people who are indulging in the artificiality dismiss real concerns or issues. We say, oh, that doesn't matter. Just be thankful. Oh, you don't worry about that financial situation. Just be thankful. Oh, you don't worry about what that, that kind of abuse. Just be thankful. That's really dangerous because then we start being thankful for something God's not wanting and God's wanting to change. We need to be thankful in God 
and never dismissive of real concerns or issues. Just is a very dangerous word. Thanksgiving can be used to intimidate, impress, or alienate others. It can be a way of boosting our ego and putting other people in their place or to deceive ourselves. Look at my new shiny thing. Thank God I have this new thing to the people who don't have that new thing. Or We don't want to, again, hide our Thanksgiving, but we want to be careful that our attitude of Thanksgiving isn't about, I deserve this. It's about God's goodness and conscious and aware of the context of other people. When I was in my PhD program, and this may be itself vulnerable, when I was in my PhD program, I was given a fellowship that completely paid for my tuition. If I had not gotten that, I wouldn't have been able to go through my PhD program. So I was extremely thankful to God for that. I, it was beyond a blessing. And yet I knew I had friends and colleagues in the program who weren't given that, and many of whom were smarter than me. And, and I'm not degrading myself. It's just the circumstances and what I had done and, that, and oriented in the work I, I, had led that to be a possibility. Um, but for them, they didn't have that. And I realized if I were to go on Facebook or in, in social context say, I got a fellowship, look at me, it would be inviting division because my blessing was a place of hurt for them. I mean, we can go down the list of things that we've been blessed with, whether relationships or wealth or all these things that become really nice elements of life if you have them and if they're used right in God, can also become be places of hurt and discouragement. We don't want to be silenced we, we, by people who don't have anything. They should be thankful for what God is doing, but we also have to be aware of the context and aware of how we can use our blessings as a way of diminishing and reminding other people what they don't have. Or like Luke 18, 9 and 14, thank you, God, that I'm not like that person, that I didn't, thank you, God, I'm not this kind of person, that I am aware, right? Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. We never do that, right? <laughs> what do we who do we regard others with contempt and think we're more righteous than well politics has a lot of that religion has a lot of that the people who believe this other religion or the people who voted for that person uh, I'm glad I'm not them how do they even live with themselves two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector the Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus God I thank you that I am not like those other people the eagles, rogues adulterers or even like this tax collector I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. I serve Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Now look at all the services I do. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The tax collector was thankful that he could pray, even though he felt the weight of it. Whereas the Pharisee didn't see a need for God and was thankful that he in his own self wasn't like those others. Again, this is why gratitude and thanksgiving are important to understand in the light of community. These are not individual disciplines. These are community disciplines because they reflect and resonate our participation in community and how we respond to others. We're not in this alone. We're in this with God. We're not in this at all. And we have a way of celebrating this. As part of our Christian devotion, Eucharist, communion, Eucharist, which is the Greek word for Thanksgiving. I give thanks. Embedded in the very liturgy of the church is this giving and orientation of thanks that isn't just about us responding to God, but is us in a community of others giving thanks. I am thankful for the sacrifice of Christ. I am thankful for the body of Christ given to me. What does the body of Christ mean in Paul? the body that is Jesus, but it's also the body that is the church. So we give thanks together. We acknowledge each other. We are to be thankful for each other in the context of being thankful for what Christ has done for us. It's a meal fellowship, an eating, a feast, a festival of life, a thanksgiving with others, a recognition of the body of Christ that says, God, you are good. And this is the good thing you're doing in this person. And this is the good thing you're doing in this person. And this is the good thing you're doing in our community and context. We celebrate, we feast together because we remember and experience the grace of what you have done already for us. And in light of that, we can live in this new way, in this new hope, in this new power in life together. And oft, as often as we do that, we celebrate and are renewed and reoriented in this discipline of thanksgiving and gratitude. For his love endures forever. Thanks be to God.